service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Would you join with me in standing as we sing our opening hymn, hymn number 142 in the blue hymnal, Faith of Our Fathers Living Still, hymn number 142 in the blue hymnal. Let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most merciful God, who has given your only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake, Grant us remission of all our sins, and by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will, and true obedience to your word, that by your grace we may come to everlasting life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us, and has given his only Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us of all our sins. To them that believe on his name, he gives a power to become the sons of God, and bestows on them his Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. 
Grant this, O Lord, unto us all. seated. The first lesson this morning comes from Isaiah chapter 65, verses 1 and 2. That's found on page 1162 of your pew Bible. Isaiah chapter 65, beginning with the first verse. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. To a nation that did not call on my name, I said, here am I, here am I. All day long I have held out my hands to obstinate people who ask in ways not good, pursuing their own imaginations. Here ends the first lesson. The second lesson this morning comes from Romans chapter 11, verses 1 through 12, and that's found on page 1761, Romans 11, starting at the first verse. I ask then, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah? How he appealed to God against Israel. Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I am the only one left, and they are trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? I have reserved myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the personal, present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace and if by grace, then it is no longer by works. If it were grace, if it were, grace would no longer be grace. What then? What Israel so, sought so earnestly, it did not obtain. But the elect did. The others were hardened, as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor eyes that they could not see, and ears so that they could not hear to this very day. And David says, may the, your table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. May their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and their backs be bent forever. Again I ask, did they stumble so that as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgressions, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if their transgression means riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their fullness bring? Here ends the second lesson. Now 
this is a little unorthodox, but oh well. Uh, looking at the text that Murray just read uh, for Reformation Sunday, how fitting they are. In the passage from Isaiah 61 or 65, talking about God's grace, calling a people who were not going to him. So all day long, I've held up my arms to an obstinate and disobedient people who are trying to come to me by all these other works that they're doing. And all along, I've been standing there wanting to save them by grace and by grace alone. And then from Romans chapter 11, uh, looking at the grace that we are saved by. Grace is, we're saved by grace and not by works. No matter how, how great our works might be in our own eyes, but we're saved by grace alone. And with that, uh, I'll invite you to open up your Bibles with me to our gospel reading for this morning, which is found on page 1519, Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 through 50. Again, that's Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 through 50. And I'll read it. Uh, I'll let you stand out. Respect for God's word. Praise be to thee, o Lord. Matthew chapter 13. Beginning at verse 44, reading in Jesus' name. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Here ends the gospel reading. Praise be to thee. We join with me in confessing our Christian faith together with the words of the Apostles' Creed. And that can be found on page 32 on your blue hymnal. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Our next hymn is hymn number 141 in the blue hymnal, A Mighty Fortress, hymn number 141 in the blue hymnal.
1929 to 1933 was a bad time for banks. It was a tough time for everyone, really. Due to a variety of conditions, banks were running out of money and going bankrupt. People who kept their money in banks rushed to try to withdraw their deposits before they lost it all. Hundreds of banks went bankrupt, leaving many of their customers penniless. Imagine Storing away your life savings in a bank that no longer has any money, and you go to take it out, and it's not there, and you're left with nothing. You put your hard-earned cash in a bank for safekeeping, only to find out that when you needed it the most, it doesn't exist anymore. People lost their trust in banks after that and started depositing their money elsewhere for safekeeping. Perhaps you know of someone who buried their money and treasures in a coffee can in a field or hiding it in mattresses and floorboards of their homes or some other secret location that would be safe that no one else would know about, that they could get it whenever they needed it. The banks had lost their trust. What else were they supposed to do? When you make a deposit, you expect it to be kept safe. In our text this morning, the Apostle Paul mentions a deposit that he's made and encourages Timothy to guard the one that's been given to him. Second Timothy is the last letter written by Paul. He's at the end of his life, and he knows it. He reminds Timothy of the precious treasure that he's been entrusted with, and urges him to guard it unashamedly. I invite you to open up your Bibles with me to Second Timothy chapter 1. So I read verses 8 through 14. And we read about the precious treasure that Timothy, and we as well, are called to protect. I invite you to stand out respect for God's word if you're able. 2 Timothy chapter 1, beginning at verse 8. Again, reading in Jesus' name. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. For this reason I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me, in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. Father God, these are your words, and your word is truth. 
We pray this morning that we would hear these sound words that were given so long ago that you continue to give to us even here this day. Help us to guard them and protect them. Help us to listen to them this morning as you speak to us through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. It's 7.50 something in the morning and we're just leaving now for school. We don't have a whole lot of time to waste because we have seven blocks to walk to get to Evan's school on time. Inevitably, though, we stop along the way, risking being late for class to pick up some priceless treasure. Usually, it's an acorn. Right, buddy? (laughs) Not wanting the acorn to get lost or dropped, it finds its way in my pocket. And now we're always finding acorns around the house. You could say that we've been decorating for fall for about a year and a half now. (laughs) But those tiny treasures are more valuable to some family members than others. But since they mean so much, they can't just get thrown away or thrown outside. After all, we've been entrusted to keep them. The treasure that Paul mentions to Timothy is also a priceless treasure. However, it's worth far beyond any acorn collection or far more than your great-grandmother's fine china. It's a treasure for which Paul is suffering and for which he also calls Timothy to join with him. He identifies that treasure in verse 8 of our text as he invites Timothy to join him in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. This precious treasure, this priceless precious treasure on the forefront of Paul's mind is the gospel. He wants Timothy to keep that gospel pure. More than anything else, Paul values this good news. His last writing, his last letter that he writes to the church, he writes to Timothy. And it deals with guarding and protecting that treasure, this good news. What is that good news? He explains it for us in verse 9. He says, Join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. The treasure is that gospel for which Paul is suffering, for which Christ also suffered, to which Timothy now has been invited to suffer too. And what exactly is that gospel? That God has saved us and called us with the holy calling, according to his purpose and his grace in Christ Jesus. It's the very core of the message of salvation. God saves us by the grace that is granted to us in Christ Jesus. It is completely and entirely the work of God. To emphasize that, Paul writes these words, not according to our works. That's the gospel message in its simplicity. God alone saves through Jesus Christ, apart from any power, from any merit, from any works, from any intentions done by us. This is God's desire from all eternity, Paul writes. This has always been God's plan for salvation. Before Jesus took on flesh and became man, before man brought sin into this world, before man had even been created, before the foundation of the earth was laid, before the beginning of time, God's plan for mankind was salvation apart from works of man. Salvation by grace alone was something that was believed by faith in the Old Testament. As believers looked ahead to the one who was to come. And for Paul and for others in the first century, it was something that they were able to see as Christ took on flesh and dwelt among them. And they saw his glory. They saw who he was. They saw what he had done. And they knew who he was. It was something they were able to see, something that had been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, Paul writes. And it's been recorded for you as well that you can see what Christ has done as you open up God's word. And there in Christ Jesus, man saw the glory of God. They saw the grace and the love of God for sinners. And the perfect son of God who took on flesh to buy our freedom through his death. Death entered the world through sin, through man's sin. And it's his sin spread to all men because all sin, scripture says, but that grace of God abounded for your word and for by the gift of the one man, Jesus Christ. And not only did he pay for our freedom, but he also delivered us from death, having abolished it with his resurrection. 
and bringing immortality to all who believe in him. Just as Jesus said, he who believes in me will live even if he dies through Christ's obedience. And through Christ's obedience alone, the many will be made righteous. Paul wrote earlier in Romans chapter 5. All of this has been made reality through the gospel, through that grace of God that's been granted to us in Christ from all eternity, not according to our works. That passage from Isaiah that was read talking about all these ways that man is trying to access God or to get God's favor, earn God's favor. And all along, God said, I've been holding my hands open, desiring to give you grace, and yet you would not. It's a treasure that needs to be fiercely guarded. Because it's a message that man is always trying to tamper with, that man has always tried to tamper with. And so Paul urges in Timothy in verses 13 and 14, retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me and the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. Timothy is called to guard that treasure Before Paul closes his final letter in his final chapter, he tells Timothy to preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season, for the time will come when people will not endure sound doctrine. Wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth. Paul tells Timothy the time will come. And in Timothy's life, the time did come. In our lives today, that time is now here. It's always been here, where people are turning their ears to hear some other gospel, to hear some other message that sounds so good. You don't have to go far in church history to see the tampering of this truth. There's plenty of false teaching going around then, in Timothy's day, in Paul's day, even while Paul and the rest of the apostles are still around. Teaching that robbed the treasure of all its worth. Teaching that pointed people away from salvation by grace alone through Jesus to a salvation through works or through some secret knowledge. The same teaching seeps into the church today and it continues to seep into the church today. Christians are clinging to works of their own rather than the grace of God delivered through Jesus. We're still trying to find those other works, those other ways that we can appease God rather than seeing that all day long he has held out his hands and he is giving us Christ and all of his grace, and yet we want some other way. It's the reason why the altar cloths have been changed today, as we remember the work of the Holy Spirit during the Reformation. At the time of the Reformation, people were being pointed to certain works of their own or certain works of others, saying that there's forgiveness to be found in this, that other people were so good that you could simply ride on the, on the merits of their coattails, that their merits would be given to you, that if you give a certain amount of money, you could buy your way out of purgatory, or that there was some possible way that you could cause God to dismiss all of your sins, some work that you could do. It was a dark time. And as Luther nailed those 95 theses on the discussion board of the day, the church door at Wittenberg calling out the practice of indulgences, saying that they are impeding salvation. They are inducing for people a false sense of security. They're finding their security and their salvation in the fact that I have this piece of paper from the Pope that says I'm good to go. Or I've done some work in my life, and so now I'm right with Christ and I'm good to go. Holding on to something that they've done rather than holding on to Christ and what he has done to God's grace in Christ Jesus. It was a time when the word of God was not readily available to the people. It hadn't been printed in the language of the people. And even if it were, most people were illiterate. They didn't know how to read. Slowly but surely, man began to find comfort and security in his own power, in his own merits, in his own works. Forgiveness was something to be purchased or earned rather than freely received by the grace of God granted us in Christ Jesus. To this day, our hearts long to find some sense of security in what we do. Whether we look to our ability to avoid sin or to be better today than we were yesterday. Whether it's being connected to a church 
or being religious, whatever that religion is, knowing the Lord's Prayer, or having had some kind of experience in the past, or feelings that you feel that you're right with God, or making it up to God for the sins that you've done in the past by doing some great work from the Lord, or by doing some great sacrifice. We're constantly being pointed back to ourselves. Deeds, not creeds. What are you doing? It doesn't matter what you believe, but what are you doing? Or fully surrender your life to Christ. Have you fully done that? Or make the Lord, Lord of your life. Is that something that you have done? And yet we're pointed again back to what we are doing rather than the grace of God that freely comes to us in Christ Jesus. God has saved us and called us with the holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted to us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. This is that priceless treasure that Paul says to Timothy, guard that treasure with all your worth, that the Spirit says to us through his word, guard that treasure. And each time someone points you someplace else for your assurance, go back to Christ and what he has done. Know that God has saved us by grace through Christ Jesus from all eternity. We need to guard this precious treasure of the gospel to protect it from false teaching, retain its sound words to keep the gospel pure, and salvation by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone. Paul includes some important words to Timothy in verse 13. He says, guard those words in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Guarding these words isn't a matter of knowing the right answers and pounding it over and over again into every person's head, but continuing to grow in the faith and the love that is in Christ Jesus. It's not sticking out your nose at everyone else who says something differently, but continuing to point people to the grace of God in Christ Jesus, saying, there in Christ you are forgiven. There in Christ your salvation was won. There in Christ are you saved pointing continually to Christ and his work, continuing to believe and trust that we are forgiven, we are counted righteous, we are pure and holy by God's grace alone, through faith in Christ Jesus, not according to our own works, no matter how good they look in our eyes, no matter how spiritual we might say they are, or others might say they are. This task isn't entrusted to Timothy alone, and it's not meant for him or for us to do it by our own power or strength. But as Paul writes, but through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. That same Spirit who leads and guides us into all truth. That same Spirit who is constantly pointing us to Jesus and what he has done. The completed work of Christ who calls us and gathers us by the gospel. It's certainly an intimidating task, but one that we don't need to be ashamed of. And one that we don't need to be afraid of either. This treasure that Paul entrusts to Timothy is a treasure the world will mock and scorn. The world has always mocked and scorned it. It's this treasure that Paul is holding to, the for, and this is the reason why he is in prison. This would be the reason that he would be put to death shortly. This is the treasure for which, for which Christ died. Treasure the word the world will deem worthless. However, as we cling to this worthless treasure... This foolish treasure that the world says. As we proclaim these sound words and seek to retain the gospel of God's grace to us in Christ Jesus. We need not be ashamed. Because this is how Christ saves us. Timothy could have been embarrassed or ashamed of the testimony of the Lord. The things that Jesus said and did. The things that he believed. The things that he taught others to believe as well. After all, he was put to death as a criminal. And there were plenty of reasons for him to be ashamed. It wasn't good for business. It wasn't good for status, for reputation, or for his own personal physical comfort either. He could have been ashamed of his friend, Paul, too, the prisoner, who would soon enough be the martyr. Paul encouraged Timothy not to be ashamed. He encouraged him not to be ashamed for this reason, clinging once again to that priceless treasure. As Paul writes in verse 12, For this reason I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Remember that priceless treasure of the gospel, that Jesus abolished death and brought life and immortality through his work, through his words, through the gospel. 
if and when Paul dies, he knows what lies ahead for him. He knows what that means. To live as Christ and to die as gain, he says. Christ has abolished death. So what reason does Paul have to fear? He's been saved and called by God's own purpose. For the grace granted to him in Christ Jesus. What does he have to worry about? His sin's been taken care of. His penalty's been paid. And he is at peace with God. He knows who Jesus is. He knows what God has done for him in Christ. He knows what lies ahead for him. And in chapter 4, verse 8, he writes these words, encouraging Timothy to look ahead. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. He is confident that God is able to keep what he has entrusted to Christ until that day. Confident that as he is trusting in Christ, Christ will keep him, guard him, and protect him until the day that he dies on this earth or until the day when Christ returns, whichever one comes first. Whatever and whenever that day may be, whether it's martyrdom or Christ's return, he is confident that God is able to keep what he has entrusted to him, and God will keep him safe. God would do the same for Timothy, and God does the same for you and for me. We don't need to be ashamed of the Savior we profess, even though there are some things that the world might deem foolish, that the world might deem ridiculous or a hard pill to swallow. He is who he says he is. He has done what he has said he would do. He saved us not according to our works, but according to his purpose. Not according to our works, but according to the grace that was granted to us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. He's abolished death and has brought us life. He keeps us and sustains us as the Spirit dwells in us, guarding that treasured deposit which has been given to us, that priceless gospel of Jesus Christ. He calls us to guard that gospel. We guard that message by studying God's word, by knowing who he is. We guard that message by clinging to Christ and Christ alone. We guard that message by rejecting the various ways that we are pointed to ourselves for our own comfort and clinging again to Jesus. In the days of the Reformation, when people didn't have God's word in their own language, when people couldn't read, one of the ways that they used to guard this truth, to protect this treasure, was through song. And through hymns, which is why we sing them to this day. One of the words from a song that was written during this time is number 410 in your hymnal. If you want to take it home and look at it, I'd encourage you to do that. But these words were written. Salvation unto us have come, has come by God's free grace and favor. Good works cannot avert our doom. They help and save us never. Faith looks to Jesus Christ alone, who did for all the world atone. He is our one Redeemer. May we be faithful in guarding this truth, clinging to Christ and Christ alone. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you and praise you for your word and for its truth. We thank you for your gospel. We thank you, Lord, that you are patient and long-suffering, that all day long you continue to keep your hands open to an obstinate and stubborn people. And Lord, that people includes me. Forgive us for the times when we look to ourselves for comfort, to our own works, to our own power, to our own merits. And Father, point us again to your Son, Jesus Christ, and what he has done for us. Help us to know that it is by grace that we have been saved. Help us, Lord, to guard that treasure and to share this message with all of those around us. Lord, for each person who is trusting in some other reason, some other source, some other comfort, other than the finished work of Christ. May we be faithful to this task. And Father, we thank you and we praise you that you are able to keep us safe, to keep us pure and holy, to keep us trusting in you until that day, whenever that day may be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This time I'll remind you of our offering. Our Sunday school offering is going to Todd and Barb Shercoke in Mexico, and the church offering is in the podium in the back. Oh. Uh-huh.
Dear Heavenly Father, your name is holy in itself, but we pray that it may be kept hallowed among us also. May your word be taught in its truth and purity, and may we as your children lead holy lives in accordance with it. Keep us from profaning your name by teaching and living contrary to your word. We pray this morning, Lord, for all of those who are dealing with various health concerns, for all those dealing with cancers, Lord, that you would heal them according to your will and your purposes. We think of Lauren and Donovan, Charles, Connie, Alan, Helen, Don, Delane, Dave, Janelle, Kale, and Colby. Lord, you know each one of their needs, each one of uh, the things that they're dealing with, Father. We pray that you would not only restore them physically to health, but spiritually too, Lord, that they would know you as their crucified and risen Savior. We pray, Father, for all the residents of our nursing homes and assisted living. We think of Edna, and we think of everyone else, Lord, that you would comfort them that they would find your presence in their hearts and in their lives here today through your word. Father, we do pray that you would bring an end to this current coronavirus pandemic, that in your mercy you would bring it to an end. We pray for all of those who are with child, Lord. We think of Aaron and Lindsay and Shailen. Lord, we pray that you would be with those children, watch over them, protect them, guard and keep them. Father, may these children grow up to love and serve you all the days of their lives. We pray for all of those, Lord, who are trying to get pregnant and for those who have had miscarriages too, Lord, that you would comfort them as they grieve and as they mourn. We pray for the families, Lord, who are mourning the loss of loved ones. We think of the Schmidt family. Continue to comfort them, Lord. And be with our military as they seek to serve us and keep us safe. Father, we pray that you'd protect them and keep them safe. Watch over Aaron too. Continue to provide for our veterans. We thank you for them, Lord. We pray that you'd be with our country that you would be with our leaders now as they seek to guide us. We pray, Lord, that you would give them honesty, that you would give them wisdom. First and foremost, Father, that you would save them if they don't know you, that they would be saved, that they would know that in you and in you alone, they can be forgiven of all of their sins, they can be saved, they can have eternal life. We do pray for our police, Father, that you would watch over them and protect them. We thank you for them. We do pray, Lord, that you would keep them safe, we pray, Father, that you would keep them doing their job in a way that brings you honor and glory. We pray for our communities that you would continue to keep us safe. And we thank you for the safety that we've enjoyed so far. We pray that you would be with, that you would send revival here in our midst, in this congregation, Lord, and, and here in this county, here in this state, here in our hearts and lives. We do pray for all of those affected by tragedies. We think of the fires that are going on now around the world and specifically in Estes Park. Father, bring, relent, uh, bring these flames to an end. In your mercy, Lord, intervene. We pray that you would be with our AFLC for the help and service fund and all of those who are being blessed by that, Lord. We pray that you would continue to provide funds for the service of your kingdom. We pray that you would be with the persecuted brothers and sisters who aren't able to worship as freely as we are. Lord, for whatever reason they're being persecuted, we pray that you would draw near to them, that you would comfort them with the gospel. Lord, that you would remind them, as you have reminded us and reminded Timothy, that you are able to keep that which we have entrusted to you until that day. We thank you for that hope. We pray that you would be with our seminary interns. And Lord, that you would bring more men to our seminary too, that you would fill the empty pulpits that we have. And be with the congregations who are looking for pastors too, Lord. We pray that you would provide men to fill that role. We pray for our missionary of the month, for the Shirkoke family in Mexico. We pray that you would be with the man who's replacing the pipes that were stolen earlier, who used to attend their church. Father, do a work in his heart. Call him back to yourself. We pray that you would be with Todd as he gets to work with him, alongside him. Lord, that he be pointing him to you. We pray, Father, that you would hear us now as you pray the prayer that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, 
and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This time we get to sing some of the words that we just read in God's word. Hymn number 525. I know whom I have believed. Hymn number 525. to